Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Diana Marsala. Uh, I'm here with my colleague Ritaraj Kirti. Uh, and today we're going to be talking about purpose limitation across a variety of different uh, data uses at Meta. Uh, yeah, so we're both software engineers. Uh, this is kind of the technology that we work on every day. A uh, quick overview of what we're actually going to be talking about today. First, we will set some context to talk about what purpose limitation actually is, some of the key challenges that we experience uh, when trying to build out solutions to purpose limitation, and then we'll give an overview of Meta's approach to this problem and one of the technologies we use for this called policy zones. Uh, so first of all, purpose limitation uh, is this idea that data is or is not used for some set of purposes. So for example, banana data is not used for bread making purposes. Uh, so no banana bread here. Uh, this is the example we'll be using throughout the presentation to explain a little bit uh, and make this more concrete because some of these uh, topics are more complicated to talk about if you don't have an example. Uh, so some of the key challenges here, uh, the first one is just that there is very limited prior art in the industry for this. Uh, there are not really well-established techniques for uh, doing purpose limitation at scale. Uh, we have a lot of really good prior art for access and authorization. This kind of who-based privacy question of uh, who can access the data, making sure that I as a user can only access the data uh, that is mine or something that has explicitly been shared with me. Things like auth tokens, user identities, ACLs. Uh, but now we're kind of trying to solve a different problem, which is the scope and purpose problem of what can be done with the data, where can the data go, uh, and limiting it based on the purposes it's used for. So for example, my phone, which is sending hundreds of requests to meta servers at any given time uh, for my own banana data, uh, I want to be able to restrict not just, oh, it's my phone, my data, therefore I can access all of it, but rather I want to make sure that uh, it's only used for some requests based on the purposes of those requests. So for example here, uh, I want to make sure that if I'm sending a request for a fruit basket or a smoothie, I can access my banana data, but not for making bread or making pizza. Those are not approved purposes for the usage of uh, this banana data. The second big problem here is just the scale at which we're working and the diversity of meta systems. Uh, we have more than 3 billion daily active users. We've got millions of assets. So these are things like tables, requests. Um, they could be functions, backend services that are doing uh, online and offline processing. Also, we are working on multitude of language, language runtimes, data systems, different APIs. And ultimately, this code is pushing continuously throughout the day. We also have more than 50,000 employees. A single API request can often invoke many, many different teams' code. These represent interesting ownership boundaries where the owner of the banana requirement may actually be very different than the owner of the code that they're working on and that they are trying to uh, protect according to this requirement. And often the people producing the data for different systems are different than the consumers of that data. And uh, finally, just the granularity of representation is an interesting challenge here. Uh, we may have an entire table that is banana data. Let's say this is a banana table with color, country, flavor of this banana. Uh, but then we may have column level granularity as well. Maybe it's like I'm making an ice cream sundae and I want to figure out, oh, does it have a banana or not? That's the one column that's banana data. And also, you can bring this down to the row level or the cell level of a table where maybe some rows are banana if we're talking about a fruit table, but others are not. Maybe they're things like apples or oranges. So we need to be able to represent this with the solution that we build. Uh, and this doesn't just apply to literal data on disk in databases uh, and tables, but also code. We have many multi-tenant systems that process a variety of different data, uh, as well as the actual databases that store these, the requests themselves. So I'll hand it off to Ritaraj now to talk about the overall approach. Thank you, Dana, for walking us through some of the key challenges that we face in achieving purpose limitation at Meta. So I'm going to talk to you about the workflow we have for finding and protecting bananas and ensuring they're being used for the right purposes. This workflow is from the perspective of what we call um, requirement owner. 
this is the person who's translating the requirements for the policy that we are trying to implement and figuring out the technical details and ensuring that those technical details are implemented. The overall workflow is very simple and straightforward, but it is not easy. The workflow goes something like this. You find where the banana, where the banana is, it's right there. You need to then figure out where all it is going. I need to ensure that the users of the banana data match what the policy describes. You, and sometimes if you find some violations, fix them. And you want to prevent new such potential violations from occurring in the future. And then finally, you want to set up a system for monitoring these safeguards continuously so that they can continue to function over time. All of this is very straightforward, but it takes a lot of work. Let's take a look at each of these in a little bit more detail. The first step for any purpose limitation project is finding where the uh, data that you're trying to protect is. In this case, the banana. Uh, you, in some cases, it may be very straightforward. You may know where the banana is coming into our systems and then tra trace it from there. Uh, sometimes you may need to scan uh, all your data systems and warehouses looking for patterns in data to figure out where something might be. You might have a fruit classifier that uh, proposes like this might be a fruit and you look at it and figure out, oh, is this fruit a banana or not? Once you have made the determination, we go and annotate those assets with a banana label. Now that we have our initial banana assets identified, uh, we look at the data flows using the lineage tools that if you have seen some of the presentations earlier yesterday, uh, they talked about how we have various systems for lineage. Um, we have three types of data flows that we consider here. You can have a data flow coming in from a source which is not labeled as banana, but going into a sink that is labeled as banana. And this is generally okay. You could also have a case where both the source and sink are banana, and this is also fine. And finally, the more interesting case is you have the source is labeled as a banana, but the sink is not. And in this case, you need to look deeper and figure out what's going on. So here again, we have uh, a few cases that might be uh, happening here. So it could be that the sink was just, was a banana, but was not labeled as such. So we fix it by applying the banana label to it. And so this is fine. Sometimes you may find that the data flow is a false positive, or sometimes it may happen that the banana is being transformed in a way that it is okay to be used. Maybe it's being blended into a smoothie and so that it is properly anonymized and no longer identifiable as an individual banana. Right? <laughs> so it could be safe to use. So in this case, we apply the label to the flow to say that we are dropping the banana label here and we also call this process reclassification. And finally, you might find some flows that are actually going into the bread making apparatus and in this case, you need to take some action. Either you refactor the code to change the behavior and remove the data flow, or you go and enable enforcement so that these flows are blocked at runtime and they don't occur anymore. Now that you have gone through this process, you want to also want to ensure that you don't have to keep repeating this over and over again, right? So we have various mechanisms, both in terms of signals that we produce at diff time, as well as uh, runtime protections that ensure that these safeguards hold true and you don't regress. And finally, we have continuous monitoring to ensure that new potential sources of bananas are found. Uh, reclassification that you did, there's no banana sneaking past the smoothie making process, and any maybe out of band poison pill checks and checks to ensure that your safeguards keep working. Now I'll hand it back to Diana to get, take us a little bit more detail. Great, so uh, let's talk a little bit about the data flow violation uh, portion of this workflow. Uh, so specifically how we discover, remediate, and prevent new violations from occurring. Uh, these data flow violations are the uh, thing that we had to build new technology to uh, solve. So kind of going back to this challenge from earlier of having a lack of standardized uh, tools in the industry to do these things, uh, we created our answer to this, which is called policy zones. 
So we're going to step through a little bit of a toy example here with our banana data of how policy zones works. Uh, so after our asset discovery step, we know banana DB exists and it has a banana annotation. Uh, so now what we want to do is uh, remediate any potential data violation, so data flow violations that we see. So we can see banana DB is flowing to banana request, but banana request does not have a banana annotation, and so this is a data flow violation. Uh, since banana request should have access, we can annotate banana request uh, with a banana label as well and remediate that. And now we have a new violation, which is from banana request to log B. Similarly, uh, this one we can remediate by annotating with a banana label. And so this is a very simple diagram, uh, but now all the data flow violations are remediated and resolved. And so we can turn on enforcement to prevent any new data flow violations from occurring. What this ends up looking like is that you are running your banana request in a banana zone. Uh, so this is our way to kind of signal to the infra that this is code that is running uh, with banana data. And so you want to make sure that you're tracking any data flows into and out of that banana zone. And since we have enforcement on here, uh, that means that when we add a new uh, data flow to log C that is not banana data, this will actually get blocked by the infra. So this is really cool for our product developers who are actually writing code on their laptops every day. Uh, and they get immediate signal on uh, things that are and are uh, not allowed according to the banana requirement. And this is cool, but it's a very small example. What if it's not your entire request that's banana data, but it's actually just a small portion of it? This is probably the more common case for a lot of our systems because uh, we have, like I mentioned earlier, all of these API calls that are doing many, many different things. Uh, and so we can zoom out a little bit and pretend that this banana uh, request is not actually a request, but rather a function in the code base. And we end up with a similar problem where make banana it has a violation to make banana smoothie. Uh, we're returning banana outside of this function to the function up the stack. So we can remediate this in the same way by annotating make banana smoothie as banana. Uh, and then, as Ritaraj mentioned earlier, we have this nice little thing called reclassification that we can use to tell the infrastructure that a data flow violation is not actually a violation, it is safe. So since the return of make banana smoothie is blending up that banana and turning it into a smoothie, uh, it's sufficiently anonymized according to the banana request. Uh, and so we can reclassify this. Uh, and similar to before, uh, we have remediated all of our violations. Uh, and so what this ends up looking like is that these functions are running in a banana zone. And that context that we are in a banana zone is threaded through the stack and uh, is propagated down to the lower functions. Uh, and then just to give another quick example uh, on more granular data flows, if we have this make food uh, common infrastructure that is running here that is sometimes processing bananas and sometimes processing bread for, say, making toast and making a banana smoothie, uh, because we have this propagation that occurs within the zone, uh, starting a zone on the make banana smoothie function will actually propagate down and uh, we'll be able to uh, keep that context throughout, and then food DB will have some rows that are banana and some rows that are not banana. Uh, so just wrapping up, uh, this tech is in use for hundreds of requirements across Meta. This isn't something we're experimenting with. Uh, this is something we actually use every day. Uh, and our current work is focusing on improving the efficiency of using these tools. And just generally, the space is fairly nascent. So uh, really excited to collaborate with folks in this community and uh, hear your thoughts. Yeah, so we're, we'll take questions now.